The import drag racing market has exploded over the last few years with competitors going faster and faster. Right now the four cylinder market has really heated up with both Mazworks and Jet Racing trading blows and world records. Right now the Mazworks S15 holds the world record for mile an hour, a touch over 229 mile an hour to be exact. However, there is a lot more to come from this car. In particular, Shane and the Mazworks team have been working really hard on changing the turbo system. And this is quite unique. They've gone to a compound system. We're here with Shane to find out a little bit more about what compound turboing is and why it's essential. So Shane, you were getting pretty good results with a single turbo on this car, let's be honest. Yeah, no doubt. What's the limitation of the single and why go to a compound system? So this, the limitation of the single is that at some point it runs out of the ability to breathe enough air and compress it efficiently enough to deliver you know, high density air to the engine. So the concept of the compound turbo is that we can put a higher airflow turbo at the front of the air system and the entry and have a secondary turbo behind it to get the boost pressure where we want and hold the efficiency of the two sets of turbos right dead center in the middle of their compressor maps. So it takes the least possible amount of horsepower to get the most amount of boost. So we'll just back up a little bit because obviously there's a lot that goes into turbo technology and just so our followers have a, a good understanding here. I mean obviously we've got turbochargers that can produce 200 horsepower through to turbochargers that are well above 2000 horsepower. So the obvious question might be, well if you're running out of compressor flow, why can't we just go to a bigger turbo? So let's talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. So the thing of it is is that the compressor that we're running um, it the time when we were last year thinking about doing this was limited to an 88 millimeter turbo. Uh, so the bottom line is that we don't want to make what an 88 millimeter turbo can make. We think we can make 3,000 horsepower with a compound setup. So the only way to get to 3,000 is have a turbo capable of delivering 3,000 to the engine, which you're not going to find a single that is anything you could actually put in a race car that's big enough to do that. Uh, so that's why we ended up with the setup you see behind us with the two turbos feeding the one turbo because it's the only way to get the capacity on the inlet side by using two big ones that are good for 1500 apiece and then the second, second one behind it to raise the pressure up to the boost it takes to make the engine make 3,000 horsepower. I think the other thing that's important to mention here is even if you could get a single turbo that was capable of delivering the airflow through the compressor that you need to make 3,000 horsepower, the problem is you're still dealing with a small capacity four cylinder engine, two or 2.2 .2 litre, anyway you're going to really struggle to spool that up. So the problem is you can get the airflow but then you don't have a usable power band, would that be reasonable? Yeah that's reasonable, I mean if you think about it in reverse, instead of from the turbo end, from the engine end. What would it take to make this engine make 3,000 horsepower? Well, we know it's going to take an incredible amount of boost because the engine's small. So we know that the engine might produce 2,000 horsepower at 90 pounds of boost. If we want to get to 3,000, we basically need 50% overhead on that. Forget the turbos. If we just hooked a box to the engine to get it to produce 50% more horsepower than 2,000, we're going to have to have enough boost pressure to get to that 3,000 horsepower number. So then it's a matter of how can we get a single stage turbo to make, let's say, 150 or 160 pounds of boost, you're just not going to do it, you, no matter what turbo you put on it. And then you have the problem you're talking about, about actually trying to use it, even if you could get it to do it. By the way, when you're trying to use a single stage compressor to get to super, super high pressure ratios, the efficiency of the compressor is so bad, you then have to do lots and lots and lots and lots of intercooling on the downstream side of that to even have air that's dense enough to get to the number you want. So that's why it has to be a compound. I think a lot of people probably miss the fact that when you compress air, physics says that we're going to heat it up. So as you say, when you go into 150 psi, straight away we can calculate what the ideal temperature of the compressor outlet is going to be. But then, as you've mentioned, as we push those turbos harder and harder, you're so far out of the efficiency range of the turbo that you're then superheating the air even more. As you've said, hot air is less dense and it's really going to be a struggle to make power. Okay, so we get the idea behind the compound turbo. And, uh, it is a very complex system, particularly given that you're now actually running three turbos on this. So could you break that down and try and give us the, the, the dummies approach to how the system actually works with those three turbos? So, so the, the reason why it works well is that each set of turbos, because um, a turbocharger is a multiplier, 
It takes in air at a certain pressure and multiplies it. That's what the pressure ratio is all about. So if the ambient pressure is 15 and the resultant pressure coming out of the turbo is 30 pounds of boost, which is in absolute terms, a three to one pressure ratio. We're taking 15, raising it to 45 absolute to get to 30 pounds. So that turbo thinks it's only making 30 pounds of boost. And then we take the second turbo with air pressure that's coming in at what we say 45 absolute, right? And then we multiply that by three again, the second turbo only thinks it's making 30 pounds of boost. And so the horsepower it takes to drive those compressors is way lower than it would be to try to get one of them to get to that resulting number of 110 or 130 pounds of boost. So that's why that part of it works. But the name of the game, like you hit on a minute ago, is air density. So if you've not got the air uh, at, at a cool enough temperature to have the density that your pressure ratio is giving you, then you end up with less power than you would have if you know if you could cool it off. So, so you're making more boost, but actually going backwards because of air not, density. Absolutely, and or sometimes you're raising the turbo into a range that takes so much horsepower to deliver that boost pressure that it subtracts away from the engine on the exhaust side. So, so some interesting things about doing the compound setup, and I read about it and certainly we're not the first to do it and maybe they've been doing compound turbos and tractor pulling for 50, 50 years maybe. Um, but this is the first time I had a chance to do it the way I wanted to do it. Um, so we chose to use a charge air heat exchanger in between each stage to give the second turbo the highest density air that we could give it. And then obviously another charge air heat exchanger behind that going into the engine. So as an example, when we ran the thing on the dyno we had a real struggle to keep a hold of the engine on the dyno. It would basically do a burnout on the dyno. The dyno couldn't load it and give us a real horsepower number that's rep representative of the boost pressure we're running. It would basically just go straight up onto the rev limiter. But as an example, um, at 135 pounds of boost, we had 135 pounds of back pressure between the, the high pressure turbo and the engine. So what the engine effectively knows is the pressure ratio across the cylinder, right? So it's one to one at 135 pounds. We still had lots of wastegate left to be able to go to a much higher boost pressure if we wanted to. We had, the day we dynoed was a pretty warm day in Florida. It was about 85 degrees ambient temperature. So we had 85 degree ambient temperature coming into the, the, the primary turbos, the low pressure turbos. Then coming out of those turbos, we had temperatures in the probably 350, 400 degree range. After the charge air heat exchanger, we were back to 90 degrees. The second turbo saw 90 on its inlet. 400 coming out of its outlet, but after the intercooler going into the engine, we had 90 degree charge temp going into the engine. So you're back to really only just a little bit above ambient despite that high boost pressure. Absolutely, and so that is where the magic happens. I just want to go back a little bit and unpack something you said a little earlier. You're talking about the exhaust back pressure, and this is probably something that starts to get a little bit more complex with turbo design, but that back pressure is really, or well in my experience, one of the keys to getting really good performance out of a turbocharged engine, and it is a balancing act between getting response and getting a low boost threshold versus power, and I've sort of found with my own drag racing that if you can keep that, that exhaust back pressure at or below a sort of a one-to-one -one ratio, that's almost like a magic point where everything kind of power-wise tends to exponentially increase. Uh, so even though you say you had 130 odd PSI of back pressure, the key is the one-to-one -one ratio, is that fair? Yeah, so effectively the back pressure, if you think about it, when the pressure ratio is constant across the engine, the, the volumetric efficiency of the engine is the same as it would be if it was normally aspirated, right? So it's breathing air into ambient, it's exhausting into ambient pressure. Whatever the airflow of the engine is, is what it is based on the cylinder head cam and all that stuff. When you start making the exhaust pressure over the intake pressure, think about a normally aspirated engine. To get that result, it would take closing the throttle down, right? So if you close the throttle down, you effectively make the engine smaller, right? Because it can't breathe as much air in the same amount of time. So the same thing happens with a turbo, even though the throttle blade is wide open. If the back pressure is way over the top of the boost, it fills the cylinder with unburnable air, right? And because it's making the cylinder full of unburnable air, it's effectively making the engine displacement smaller. So the higher, the higher the back pressure goes compared to the boost, the smaller the engine thinks it is. Now on the dyno you mentioned that you are running heat exchanges between the different stages of turbo. And when we're on methanol fuel, this is something that seems to be a divided division between different races. Some will swear by retaining an intercooler, some will just use the latent heat of evaporation of the methanol fuel mm. to do the, the cooling. 
obviously adding heat exchangers does add weight and complexity to the system. And what I'm wondering is, can you instead use maybe injectors to spray methanol between the stages of turbo for an intercooling effect, or is that not as effective? So yeah, obviously trying to cool the charge off spraying methanol in is better than not doing anything at all. But when you raise the temperature of the air to the second turbo, you're effectively making that turbo think that it's working at high altitude because the density of the air is less than what it would be at ambient. So that changes how you have to size the turbo then for the engine. You now need an even bigger second stage turbo to get the same total amount of airflow out. Right, so in my opinion, this is the only way to do it, which is why it's the way it is. Um, and I, I don't see the point of the weight uh, typically. So let me take a step back because I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to work on cars and with teams where we're running to the limit, right, of what these components can achieve. Would it be worth adding 500 pounds to the car to go make 2,000 horsepower with a compound turbo like we can make with a single stage on this engine behind me? No, it would not be worth that. But I don't think there's a chance we could get to 3,000 horsepower without intercooling. So in the case that we can make 50% more horsepower, okay, the weight that we're gonna add will be insignificant when you compare power to weight ratio of the car. Right? So yes, of course, this car will have more weight than it would with a single turbo on it and only one intercooler or no intercooler. But at the end of the day, we'll have such a greater power to weight ratio on the car, we should be able to outperform it anyway. Seems reasonable when you put it like that. Uh, I just want to talk about the boost control strategy because, again, on a compound turbo, this just makes things that much more complex and you've got wastegates on each stage. So can you talk to us about how you're controlling the, the boost pressure? So having never um, done a compound really before, I was really nervous about all of those things that everybody's always really nervous about. So this engine actually has four wastegates. Now two of them are obvious because they're leading up to the two primary turbos. But the other two wastegates were there because we were afraid that the back pressure might be way low and therefore the airflow rate out of the, out of the wastegate would be low and we might get into a situation where we couldn't control the boost. And unlike a single turbo, uh, if you go out of control on the boost, it can make whatever's 50, 60 pounds. But with a compound setup, because the two compressors are capable of nine to one each, it's effectively nine, nine times atmospheric pressure times nine. It's potentially capable of 380 pounds of boost, which we know for sure will make the engine have more pieces than it started with, which we don't want to do that. Yeah, they would probably turn it into a kit set pretty right, quickly. Right. The dimension between the valve cover and the oil pan would for sure get longer that way. So um, anyway, so the, the idea was to be able to have enough bypass. I thought we might have to add like some drive-by-wire throttle body to be able to do it. But in practice, it turns out that the back pressure, like I said, to the engine is exactly what the boost is. It's one-to-one. -one. Yeah. So I actually got rid of one of the two wastegates on the dyno because I found that it was so big that if it opened at all, it dumped all the boost out and I couldn't control it effectively. So. What ended up happening was when I sorted through some of the stupid small things I had wrong when we started because I'm dumb and I hooked up things the wrong way, when I fixed the mistakes that I had made, um, it believe, unbelievably it was, it was exactly how the boost control would work on a single stage. What I did was I would watch the pressure ratio of each set of compressors. I would run them up at the exact same pressure ratio. So I would be two to one on the first set of compressors and two to one on the second set. It took an offset in, I'm using wastegate pressure on dome pressure on top of the wastegate, right? So it took an offset to get the two of them to be two, two to one, but from that point, I could raise them by a percentage and they literally would track each other straight up. So if I raised the primary turbo by 20% and that resulted in a two and a half to one pressure ratio, I did the same 20% to this one and that resulted in a two and a half to one ratio on that one and I ended up with exactly what I wanted anyway. And it wasn't scary at all. So maybe not quite as complex as you had made it out to be in your mind? I totally had in my mind had all these questions and thought I had answers and all those answers were wrong and the questions weren't even right either to begin with. So it, it, it turned out to be docile and completely predictable and everything I was scared it was not going to be. So a couple of takeaways from this. Uh, we've interviewed you a number of times and you're probably one of the highest profile import tuners, uh, tuners of all engines for that matter, uh, around the world. 
great to hear that uh, you're still learning and I think that's something that probably our viewers need to take into account is no one knows every, everything in this industry, there's always something new to learn and personally for me that's why I'm still passionate about the industry because every time I get a car on the dyno there's still something new to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Look, what, what you find is the more knowledge you gain, the more questions you have. So it's a never ending process. So for me, yeah, it's, it's, I'm all about learning in every way, every day. Uh, just coming back to that boost control as well, there's one other thing that I want to touch on with regard to that that's important to understand is you would probably struggle with a compound turbo to get that level of control with a lot of ECUs because clearly they, they don't have strategies in place for compound turbo charging, but you've got the ability to essentially write your own firmware to make the ECU, in this case the Motec M1 range, do essentially whatever you want. Yeah, so, so I took literally the software that we ran the single stage engine with and added the extra control features that I needed for the compounding, recompiled it, and that became the software for the compound. But that also means that all of the setup, it was literally as easy as dumping the file out of that engine into this engine with the new software control strategy, doubling up what I'm doing with the wastegate control so I've got two separate ones, and off we go. We started it, fired it right up, checked the timing, and made a pull. Done. Sounds remarkably easy. Now, 3,000 horsepower from a four-cylinder on face value sounds crazy, but we know you guys, both uh, yourself and Mazworks, are probably the guys that are capable of doing it if it's possible. But that also begs the question, how much power can you actually get to the track? Can you use all of 3,000 horsepower? And at the same time, if you can use 3,000 horsepower, how fast is this car going to go? So... So the first thing is that we're going to make 3,000 horsepower and then we're going to figure out how to use 3,000 horsepower, whether we need it or not. The way this project started was a guy came to us at World Cup last year and saw what we were doing and said, I like how you guys work, I like your team, and made the mistake of asking me what would be the craziest thing I could think to do with one of these engines. And I, and I kind of, off the cuff, just kind of jokingly said, well, I'd put compound turbos on on this one and go make 3,000 horsepower with it, and then I'd go put it in a car and be the first four-cylinder in the fives. Now, last year when I said that, the record was 626, and we weren't even remotely close to that. As we've progressed, and with the kind of rivalry going back and forth between us and Jet, it's now, now I'm starting to wonder if it's not possible for one of the two of us or someone else to be able to run a five with just a single setup. I mean, it's, we're at the, we're at the cusp of the same place we were when the Supra broke gas motorsports record of 626 or 627. I mean, think about these numbers. They're almost all the same, right? And what happened is we went 615, and all of a sudden it was like, man, the quest for the fives was on. We're in the same place we were. I can't even believe this. Like four years later, we're now talking about potentially being able to do it with four cylinders. If you'd asked me then, I said, there's no way you could ever do it with four cylinders. Now I'm starting to wonder, I think we might be able to do it, or Jet might be able to do it. But if we can't do it with that one, our goal is to do it with this one. This is going in a real pro mod car, and literally the goal is simply to go first in the fives. If we can do it, and if not, we'll go the deepest into the fives. We actually think we might be able to compete with a six-cylinder class with this car. Given the, the times that we're seeing from the six-cylinder cars these days and how deep they're into the fives, that it's certainly been an impressive feat, but even saying that, anything with a five in front of it, I'd be pretty happy with with a four-cylinder. Look, it's been interesting getting some insight into that setup. It is insane, 3,000 horsepower from a four-cylinder. I look forward to seeing it, and uh, we wish you all the best getting into that five-second bracket. Cheers, Shane. Uh, thanks to you guys for what you do, as always. But I want to touch on one little part of this package that makes it seem like I'm not so crazy. When we ran this engine on the dyno behind me with a single stage, it made 2,000 horsepower. It made about 1,240 foot-pounds of torque. So we know that in order to make that number, 3,000 horsepower, at the same RPM, we'd have to raise the torque way up, and that would obviously, like I said earlier, try to change the dimension between the valve cover and the oil pan. The way we're going to try to achieve our goal is to rev the engine to 12.5. We know already that the parts can maintain 1,240 foot-pounds. If we can maintain 1,300 or 1,350 at 12.5 by being able to ramp the boost up to 200 pounds or whatever it's going to take, we know we're not asking the parts to hold anything more than they are already capable of, other than going with higher inertia because the RPM's higher. But like a motorcycle, if we can take advantage of the 12,500 RPM, that that did 2,000 at 10,000 RPM, 
we can hold the engine up there with enough gears to keep the engine from breaking itself, and that'll be how we get to 3,000 horsepower. So it's not, it's not like I'm thinking we're gonna be able to put 250 pounds of boost on it and make you know, 2,000 foot-pounds of torque at 8,000. We're gonna try to stretch everything we can just to get to that number. Look, I don't think anyone would say you're crazy, and I think your results already speak for, them, for themselves, but yeah, great to get that insight. And again, we wish you all the best, Tess. Looks like we closed the show down. It looks that way. Thanks to you guys, I appreciate what you do. If you liked that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson. You'll learn about performance engine building and EFI tuning, and you'll also have the chance to ask questions, which I'll be answering live. Remember, it's 100% free, so follow the link to claim your spot.